basically just uh, when I'm home, my, my internet signal is very, very limited, as I've told you guys before. So when I'm at home, I generally just hit the go live button. Everything works and I just do it off, off YouTube. But uh, when I'm on the road and I'm going to have guests, I like to do something a little bit better. So the service that I've been using and I've been shown is, is a, a service called Streamlines, as you guys can see. And I can have guests and everything's been good. But the one thing that I've been wanting to add to those presentations is the ability to be able to share pictures and videos to, to flush out so you don't have to just stare at this amazing beauty all the time throughout the whole thing. And I have... On my desktop, I have a whole folder. They're all labeled. They're all ready to go. Of all the stuff that we were going to be talking about tonight. But when I hit the share screen button, it decidedly does not work. Now, that, that technical issue is entirely on my end, and it might very well be Mac issue related. I don't know. But uh, I pulled on a, a couple of nerd friends to try and help me out, and we weren't able to resolve it. So I apologize tonight that we won't have all the pictures and stuff, but you guys have seen all the videos and everything like that. And if you have any questions, by all means, you can get a hold of me, and I can help you out that way. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you guys to some very dear friends of mine. Their names are Ivan and Cheyenne, and I met this, this, this young couple, and these, they, they impressed me from the minute I met them. Uh, their facility is state-of-the-art. The animals they have are exceptional. The quality and care and their passion rings true in everything they do. They are not just into isopods. They run a, com a company called Species Canada, and they sell it right across Canada, and I met them because I had this idea I found out about isopods and I knew nothing about them. I'd heard from one of the people in one of the videos that I'd done, Mr. Dan Fryer, in some of the videos I did with the different uh, rattlesnakes and cobras and stuff like that. Uh, he was doing bioactive vivariums for his reptiles. And it made it very, very simple to keep bioactive for a cobra because then he didn't have to go into the cage constantly. It really limited his act, uh, his ability to get bitten. So that was a real smart idea. And I'd love that whole concept. So I read a little more into it. Then I met these lovely people. And uh, they kind of opened the doorway. I don't know, but I fell into this thing full forward and I've never stopped back. So without further ado, let's bring them in. Everybody, this is Ivan and Cheyenne from Species Canada. Hello. And going? we're going to be talking about, I don't know, do you, were you guys able to hear what I was saying in the background? Yeah, so you don't pretty much. Yeah. Just a little bit delayed. Okay, okay. That's fine. I'm sorry. I, did, I didn't want to make it like a secret or anything. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Fisher and Fever, for the, for the super sticker. It's very much appreciated. So today, we're going to go over a bunch of topics pertaining to isopods. If anybody's got any questions, by all means, add them into the into the into the chat, and we'll get to them as we're talking. Uh, as I said, we you know we wanted to have a bunch of things to flush it out with with different pictures, and they're all ready to go. But just with the technical issues, I couldn't make that happen. So it happens. <laughs> that's, that's me. That's it. my technical issues. Is my life. <laughs> Now, I've been to your guys' facility on numerous occasions, and I've been blown away since the first time I walked through the doors, and I could spend the whole day there. And we've done stuff with plants. We've done stuff with reptiles and lizards and snakes and some dangerous snakes. Uh, and then and there's the isopods. And every single time I come, there seems to be about a dozen more tubs every time. And I know, I know it's her. I know the isopods are her. I know that. I know That's the snakes. I know the snakes are definitely not you. <laughs> no, no, no. He's, he's not, not like me. But yet in this in this warehouse, you have some pretty uh, pretty dangerous ones. <laughs> a few. Not okay. too bad. Yeah. Not <laughs> um, a heck of a lot, though. No, no. We used to keep a few front bank stuff, but we kind of, you know. We moved away from yeah, that Yeah, a little bit, yeah. yeah. Anti-venom is a little more difficult to get in Canada, so. Mm. We don't want to risk anything. <laughs> Having been bit by a venomous snake, I, the, the fact that the venom is available or not available is not should, is not the only factor. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> kind of is, but <laughs> the, the isopods, the, the isopod aspect. I know it's a terrible segue, but the isopod aspects fascinated me to the point that I think this is the next wave. Now, if I were to digress and go back, probably. I'm going to say seven, eight, maybe even 10 years ago, I was at the big international trade show in Germany on, on the industry side called Interzoo. It has ha happened every two years, and it is the biggest industry trade show in the world. And in oh, this wow. show, 
aquatics and reptile and the stuff that kind of blends together in that kind of area is far bigger in Europe than it'll ever be in North America. Yeah. They're far more advanced. They're far more, what I would say, ethical in the way they do everything. Uh, and the thing that fascinated me the most was the diversity of stuff that was available. And yes. more importantly, not on the reptile side. I remember seeing several booths that sold beetles, all those giant scarab beetles and the, the ones with the big horns and all yeah. those things. And I remember spending a lot of time in that booth talking with the individual and they all spoke English very well. Mm -hmm. And I thought this could be the next big wave. You know, if we could get these into Canada, this would be like keeping a beta, but in a different way. You know what I mean? It would just yeah, be exactly a whole yeah. thing. And he went through the whole life cycle of how to keep these things. Uh, and I, I know I'm generalizing, but he says, you buy the larvae and then you basically keep it in a bucket under your bed. Or maybe not under your bed, but you just keep it in a <laughs> bucket. <laughs> Some people will do it. And it might sit there for three, six months before it does anything. And then all of a sudden it'll like awaken and move around in the bucket. And then that's the next phase. And then you move it from the bucket to this. And then it's like three, four months. And then all of a sudden, boom, it transforms from that to the beetle. And then it grows up to be the adult beetle. And that beetle that you see, that stunning, beautiful thing, lives for like eight weeks and then dies. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> We're like, that doesn't sound as exciting as I originally thought it would be. But I guess I, the process, I, though. It's a process. I think yeah. most of the time. Like, I mean, it's just a process of getting from one end to the other end of things. But I guess if you don't see the larvae, then yeah, I, guess that's true. <laughs> I don't see you getting those things. I always thought about those things, those things that, you know, a lot of them eat vegetation. Yeah, they're not bringing them into a country that is agricultural. No, no. <laughs> yeah. We're so when I, exactly. and I start seeing all these isopods, I was thinking like, how is this even happening? How's these things? But they're more of a detrivore. Like they're kind they of, are. Exactly. they are. And they're not considered as like, you know, like insects or anything like that. Well, like, they're crustaceans. They're right? crustaceans. So, so they're, they're, they're different. Yeah. They're not really considered a pest as opposed to millipedes yeah. or beetles or but, unfortunately but seeing, still millipedes too. Being at your facility and seeing the diversity that very first time it was like a kid in a really horrible canvas. <laughs> <laughs> but being there the first time and seeing that incredible diversity and your excitement and your enthusiasm and passion, you guys have gone really dark all of a sudden. Oh, or, as oh it's, just, uh, it's the lighting. It's the uh, the windows. Okay. the windows are getting really, okay. really dark right now. But uh, seeing your guys' passion and enthusiasm with these things, showing each one of these species and you know all their names, and all of them are very different. I know there's several different genera, and we'll get to that in a minute. But they were they were so diverse and so the, the shapes, the colorations, everything, and I that immediately brought me back to that show in Germany. And I, hey, this is something really cool. I can get in on the groundwork on this, and I can start playing <laughs> with this, and. Uh, I trust me, I see Wally from Supreme Gecko is here. Thanks, Wally, for joining us. And I'm like, I, I don't care if you got one type of isopod or you got 10 or you got 100. Yeah. I don't view it as a competition. Have as many as you want. Yeah. <laughs> I have no That's what it should be, right? Yeah. Having hundreds and hundreds of species. I just want to have 20 to 25, 30 species, the ones that I enjoy but the ones that I could tell a story about and something exactly. that I could bring that science side, uh, the ecology side, something that, you know, interesting, that's something I could tell that story on. Then. That's what I want to do. So I, I, the, how many isopods have, you, have I gotten from you now? Probably close to 20. Okay. <laughs> Probably 20, yeah, like around yeah. 20 or more, I think. But that's the fun thing about isopods. They're, they're endearing, they're yeah. addictive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going back to what you're saying about variety, like they come in a multitude of shapes, sizes, colors, everything. There's yeah. one, you know, one for everybody, basically. There is, yeah, and, and like I mean, there's the multitude of colors, the uh, the species alone, how they look like in terms of like yeah. the the, uh, the structure of them, you know, like I mean, it attracts every single person out there, right? Like it, it's, there's there's always a nice spot for everybody, mm -hmm. and they're Thanks. vastly different from like uh, the ones that you know. And I agree, Wally did a video on on. Uh, Supreme Gecko did a video of his top five isopods based on his recommendations. Yeah. And if you haven't seen the video, I, I, I suggest you go check it out. It's it's a very, very well done video. But I don't wanna I don't wanna uh, give away the teaser, but the he's right. The number one is the native isopods. 
Exactly. You can They're always in your yard and you could, you know, if you get your kids like I do, I get my kids involved and I'm sure you're two mankai are going to be involved. <laughs> He's, already, yes. okay. <laughs> He's already flipping um, um, logs and everything like that when yeah. we go to, to any like provincial park or anything like yeah. that. He flips like he logs sees and everything doing like it, that. So he does it yeah. basically. Yeah, but like taking him out and just doing that stuff and seeing that, getting him out. I love seeing Paisley's face get excited about that. We've been doing this for almost a year now, and every Saturday, if I'm home, which I am now, obviously, but every Saturday I'm home, that I was mom to have her cup of coffee, and I say, Saturday morning, what do we do Saturday morning? She goes, ice pod! <laughs> and then we run downstairs and do all the ice pods. But the problem is we're getting like up to 20. She's kind of tapping out at about 15. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Kind of losing interest after about 15. So she brings that giant plastic isopod toy. Hers yeah. is orange. She brings that downstairs. So she loves her new ones that she got from you guys that you gifted her, those uh, uh, lady is orange. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're breeding like crazy all of a sudden. So she loves those. That's so. like Finn with the, the little red with the, plastic one. Uh, with the one plastic one. one. Oh, my God. He Finn. goes crazy for it. He's kind of taken it apart a few times. Yeah. <laughs> There's been a few limbs already out and in and yeah. put back again. But that and his, uh, his baby shark, that's his number one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, uh, there's a there's a question from the group from Wally it says Chris, do you see similarities between isopod keepers and fish keepers? Maybe better said isopod keepers and freshwater shrimp keepers. Well, Wally, the truth is is that's kind of what brought me somehow indirectly to this. I refer to them as land shrimp, and I love the ecology and the physiology aspects of how they they're crustaceans. They're actually crustaceans, and there's a. Um, the saltwater, on the saltwater side, the marine side, there are several different species of isopods, but uh, some of them are a lot meaner than the freshwater ones. <laughs> There's saltwater isopods that will actually go in as a parasite and take camp on the palate or tongue of a fish and then consume that and be, replace the tongue with itself. That's pretty mean. That's pretty dark and evil, but they're there. And then there's the giant isopods, which live in the deep water, and they're in the Caribbean, they're in, in the in the Philippines and Japan, yeah. Asian areas and stuff, and they get monstrous. Like, they get to, like, 18, 20 inches in size. And I've seen them in some public aquariums, and I don't think there's any animal on our planet that you could say looks more alien than the giant isopod, the giant deep they're water amazing. salt one. Yeah, they're, they're, they, they are huge. and um, A lot of people, though, when you talk to them about isopods, that's what they associate as isopods. They don't realize that these, yeah. you know, the soap bugs or the pill bugs that they mm -hmm. find, you know, underneath some rotting wood when they're camping or things yeah. like that, those are isopods, too. People yeah. don't realize that. No, nope, they don't. And, like, I mean, I was saying is that, um, like, those, uh, those giant isopods for the sea and whatnot. Like, I mean, when I was in Japan, I've never really notice how big they are until i see one in flesh and because they, they use it for food right like i yeah. mean um they they uh they take out the shell and everything like that they do doesn't it they taste good them. though it tastes really good apparently like <laughs> i mean i i didn't taste it but i saw it like how they cook it and everything and they're gigantic they're probably a foot and a half if not more well, people even talk about the ice the normal isopods that we keep are are they're eating them in some countries because they say they taste like shrimp i'm like okay <laughs> We should try that. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is sometimes when there's like an older, you know, like an older uh, individuals or something that happened, because there, there's some species that when they get old, like, I mean, they don't live very long. That's so right. when do, when they do die, you can smell the, like shrimp. The, the shrimp smell on them. Old, like, decomposing. Yeah. Like, it's you shrimp. leave shrimp on a couch for a couple days kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I would recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man we did that on fishing one time we were uh, fishing for catfish and we were using shrimp as a bait yep. and uh we left it in the car forgot about oh, it oh yeah it stinks like yeah don't do hell. that <laughs> <laughs> so with, with all the isopods the stuff that's everyone's keeping in captivity now i think this honestly could get bigger and bigger i think we're only at the infancy right now of what we're seeing for how popular they can get yep. because the culture of most of them is very simple. Basic plastic tub that you could buy at a pet store or at a, even at something like a Walmart or a home supply store. And the supplies that you need to put inside that for their care is all very minimal, right? It's exactly. easy. Yeah. And it's, it's not expensive too for most people to do. 
It is, yeah. 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 Like, I mean, it's, it's the, the care wise, like, as long as you know the basic and everything like that, putting together a, like a. Um, like a basic. Like a basic yeah. uh, space for them or a place for them for that they can, you know, live and produce and and and, and, um, and thrive doesn't cost that much. Like, it's you, you get the tub. It's the ice plus it costs. It's the cost. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> Some ice I can go all the way up there. Yeah. Oh, some of them are crazy. And then, as you guys have shown me, there's vast differences in different markets, like Canada versus the US. The diversity of what species are available is, is huge. Yeah. The differences and the price point between the two markets is vastly different on some of them, too. I think exactly. the price point in itself is the more astounding part. Like, mm -hmm. if you talk about Porcilio in Europe, buying like buying some Porcilio species in Europe that is to America, Porcilio in itself is so much more pricier in America than it is, yeah. sometimes Europe. Yeah. In Europe, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But and so and they, like, well, I was talking with one of you guys today. So you guys, people that don't know, they share an account for Messenger and everything. So when yeah. we talk with them, you don't really know which one you're talking to. <laughs> yeah, unless I put my name on the very end. But most of the time it's her. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things we were talking about today was about uh, the different types of uh, tropical plants and how that's going through a craze right now. And everybody yeah. wants these, what I call monster plants. And I'm not talking about monstera. I'm talking just monster plants, plants that are not natural, like these variegated or plants yeah. that are, you know, throwing these mutations where a leaf is half white and stuff like that. I don't exactly. personally find those appealing whatsoever, but supply and demand for these things. You're taking a, a plant that you could buy at a Home Depot for $20, and then you're taking a cutting of one that produced a white leaf. I'm for taking the cutting. You could sell the cutting for $250, $500 to $1,000, depending on the market over here. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people actually go to, you know, like the big box store, like Home Depot or Rona or anything like that, 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 that supplies those big plants. And they actually look every single stem Variation. and yeah. look every single leaves for any, some sort of signs of irrigation on it. Yeah. Just to, just to get it from there. And then hopefully that they can, Cut you know, back on that note. exactly, yeah. and cut back on that note, and then all of a sudden they'll they'll have more variegation or less variegation. Like variegation is very very rare. Like it's I mean, it, it is, yeah, yeah. Like you want to get variegation on all your philodendrons, monsteras, epibedrums. You want to know how to do that? Infect them with a virus. <laughs> 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 you infect them with a virus, they'll all have that nice mottled color, and you'll make a fortune. <laughs> oh yeah, especially right now with all the. Um, Tissue cultures that's happening nowadays, like it's, it's um, the prices are gonna go down with the one that can be tissue cultured. But the one that yeah. can't be tissue cultured, then it's gonna, it's, it's probably gonna stay like that price for, yeah. I would say two as years. As long as the demand. And I guess you know, going back to isopods, it's very similar in that. Look at, you know, kubaras. Kubaras have a huge interest right now. You know, when you talk to people generally about isopods that have a, you know, idea of what they want, people mention rubber duckies, yeah. and. You know, because of that, the demand is just skyrocketed. And that is one of the worst species for somebody starting out in isopods. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're super cute to look at, but enjoy them while they're in the little tub. Because the minute yeah. you release them into, they're buried into the substrate. Because yeah. how many times have we look? You have you guys have a culture of them. They've been doing it, but like every time we've come there to do anything, we never find them. They're there. Yeah, they're, they're always they're always like most of the time. A lot of the the, the covariate species they they. They, they go down to the substrate. They don't really. They yes. do hang around in the in the um, in the logs and everything like that. They put on the top, but a lot of them, especially when they're smaller, they go down. Yeah. yeah. From what yeah. we've noticed, yeah. at least as they get older, they become a little bit more bold. But so, let's get back to some of the intro type questions that I had down here. Is this why isopods? How did you guys, you know, go from, how, or maybe even before isopods? Let's talk about species Canada. Oh my. <laughs> you, you both had similar types of interests, but your interests are also different too. You know, you, you, I know what Cheyenne, some of her interests are, and I know Ivan's are somewhat different, but you guys come together and you're this cohesive unit that is Species Canada, and you guys complement each other very, very well in everything that you do. Yeah, fine. Thank you. How did Species Canada come to be? I think it, it kind of started, um, we were looking into, I would say, looking into some geckos to go through. We, mm -hmm and um, a local shop to us, Winnipeg Reptiles. I was 
volunteering at for a while. And they had a Chihua gecko there, and we were kind of talking about it. You know, should we take the plunge into it? Yeah. Should we not? And we unfortunately took the plunge. <laughs> so that's where, like, I mean, we we um, we took. Like at first, we have some like one or two ball pythons that we because yeah. it's it's always her snakes is always her passion. Like that, that's that's where her that heart is. is. Um, but I guess for her to to kind of like. Pull me into it. <laughs> I was like, I need so, to get this guy into the hobby. Let's uh, let's use geckos as a and, and then geckos is, is like I like geckos. Like for me, ever since before, like I mean, geckos has always always been in in, in um, my passion or yeah. or the one that I always look after. You know, like but um, so we we got the uh, Chihuahua gecko, like the uh, the um, they're from New Caledonia, and. Um, so we, we got that one right there, and we're like, you know what? We have a spare bedroom in the old house. <laughs> so, so we're like, so let's... Bed out, out. How's the spare bedroom working out with your two children? <laughs> well, there's, the, in the new house we're here, like, um, this, there, this, there's no spare bedroom. And in the world, I have one where, where Levi is, which is our youngest son. And then uh, Finn has his own room as well. And then, well, most of the time, because he wakes up at middle of the night and then goes storming our, our our room, and then he just sleeps right in the middle of us without knowing it whatsoever. But, um, yeah, we started off with that one room, probably 300 square feet. And yeah, not even. We ended probably up like filling smaller. it up faster than we, you know, than we yeah, expected. Yeah. We dipped our toes into Europlatus, which was absolutely amazing, and a few other different species. and. That one room turned into which yeah, we then, then the we, cold room. Then we uh, we were like, eh, because how many lights that we have in that room, especially around in that room, it's a small room, right? Like because with all, all the lights and we're using T eights before and T eights are extremely hot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're using double T eight lighting and then um, so two of them and they're four footer each, and I think I have a shelving of maybe uh, two two feet by by eight feet and I have maybe like three of them on on all sides <laughs> so each of them have because they're eight footer they they all have um, uh, four uh, four feet dual like so that and on one section there is four lighting of t8 and it's giving enormous amount of heat yeah. and uh, up to a point that we're we're noticing you know act, less activity from the geckos due to the fact that it's getting really Hot. Yeah, ambient temp was too much. So, for the um, that we were well, we did room. because we have other animals that are in there that needed, you know, heat lamps and everything like that. So what we did is we're like, hmm, we have another room that we use for for gaming because we we do, you know, like we did more gaming then than yeah. we do now. But but um, <laughs> we don't have a way of interrupting the gaming. <laughs> <laughs> we have time before. So <laughs> what we did is we took that down, yep. move computers and whatever we have into the living room now and we put the um the the hotter stuff yeah. in that room so anything that involve evolve heat heat mats or heat lamps or anything is in that room the other room that we're getting warmer room, room and a cooler room yeah, yeah and then yeah. we put air conditioning in there yeah. i i don't i don't even know how to th this is like six seven years eight years ago but yeah. i don't know where to um put the ducting in, like how to vent those portable AC, whatever, right? So I don't know where to vent it, because like, do I drill a hole for the outside of the house? Or, which is like- just, You know what I'm just shaking my head here? This is <laughs> my wife is doing. Now, so the, so the move from, from that to go into yeah. the facility that you guys have now, was that was that primarily because you wanted it all out of the house? See, normally that would be one of the partners would say, get all your crap out of here, or we're over. But you guys are both into it, so you can't really blame each other. Or was that move more along the lines that you you wanted to go into certain animals that you knew you couldn't keep in the city of Winnipeg because of the bylaws? I, I think was. that's one one of the, uh, one the, of the reason reasons. why we we moved um, into into a facility. But um, more, like the main reason why is that because when when we were there, when we were at the older house, we we uh, don't know. How to manage the having the kids in the house, 
With all the animals. With all the animals. Yeah. And then, then the, um, that, that's when, before we even get any venomous whatsoever. But um, we don't know how to move from the house. From, from, we don't know how to manage the kids and plus the house, right? So when, when we bought a new house, we were, we, we, I wanted to have no animals whatsoever in the house. Uh, the only Sacred animals, and say, well, we were just the chameleons downstairs, but um, yeah, those are, <laughs> <laughs> so those are the, the reason why we move in because we don't want any, any it was animals. also the ease of access to like when our old, when we had the two rooms in the old house, it you'd be going back and forth between both of the rooms, it was very, very tedious. Yeah. So when we got the facility, having everything all together. It wasn't so hard. We didn't have to go from one room to another. You know, if I was feeding, for example, you know, if I was feeding the snakes, I'd have to go from the hot room, feed everybody in there, to the cold room. Mm -hmm. It was just. It was a lot easier having everything. And the stuff that we can do so too, as well, is like it's it's having no windows whatsoever in the facility helps so much in terms of us controlling the light cycle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a big difference. Yeah. And then, well, my um, wife has a very set rule that I'm not allowed to have any animals in my house that require being fed by crickets. <laughs> not allowed to have crickets in our house. So I can imagine the amount of animals you guys had. It must have sounded like a nice symphony at night. Oh yeah, especially with the frogs too. Yeah. Like we always go there. <laughs> we always go there at nighttime um, in, the, in the colder room in, in the facility. Uh, we we go there and and at nighttime when all the lights are off. And um, like all you hear is just yeah. fan because we have two, those huge, like uh, I forgot what they call it, like uh, they're, they're drum fans, right? Yep. I have two drum fans in both sides to circulate the air and we have um, uh, AC unit in there. But um, all you can hear is, is the AC going, the fan going, and like the crickets chirping like everywhere. And then you got different, different, um, different um uh frog species singing ones. and another one another, another, one, another one for my wife total deal break. <laughs> <laughs> i think i think that was our biggest problem though is we're both so involved in the hobby and it's quite addictive to both of yeah. us there's no one really holding each other back that right? is you know, the worst thing ever it's like oh do should we go into this species and you know there's no one saying no let's not yeah. do that there's very are, um rare occurrence that you know, any of us says no yeah. on anything, especially if she comes to me and she's like, oh, look at this one right here. It looks cool or whatever, you know, and. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did, you end up, how, did, how did isopods come into play here? How did you get you started? Which one was guilty of this? And did it start with one species? <laughs> it, it, it was, honestly. Um, so back when we did all of the, uh, you know, because we do naturalistic. Yeah, we do plant yeah. yeah. Um, one of our main isopods we'd use in the setup was dwarf whites, mm -hmm. which is a common hobby staple for everybody. And mm -hmm. probably about three years ago, we were looking at you know a lot of the different species, mm -hmm. and the first thing that Just popped before, up before the, the, there is um there is a, a species of isopod that is known in the dwarf frog or, or anything that does naturalistic variant. They call them um, giant orange. All the isopod. common names. The, that's a common name. Which is Scabber. Which is Scabber, yeah. So um, before we're like, I wonder if we can still get like, you know, Somebody, giant orange yeah. or whatever. And um, it started having the dairy cows at that point. Then we're like, oh, maybe we should go get a dairy cow. We got dairy cow. Oh, maybe we should go get another one. And then we ordered, then we started ordering five at a time and then 10 at a time and then I 20 see. at a time. <laughs> So there basically, you guys are telling me that you had a pusher before before you guys were a pusher for me. <laughs> I think she's more of the pusher. <laughs> when um, there used to be a local guy to us, um, and I remember he had a huge frog room, beautiful frog room, and there was one day he came to us and he was like, oh, you know, I've got isopods too. And this is probably six, seven years mm -hmm, ago. Mm -hmm. We got our dwarf whites from him as well, and he's like, "Oh, I've got giant purples. I've got giant oranges, and you know all of those, you know, the common names yeah. that people." Which we didn't know the giant purples you can find outside, or you know the giant oranges <laughs> from Brazilio Scabber. But at that point, there wasn't any of these, you know, how do I say it? More uncommon species yeah. in the hobby, yeah. at least in Canada. Mm -hmm. But until uh, until um until a few of them starts trickling in, but those are more likely just the latest because. 
at first those are the one that that trickled in Blavis and the scabbard the scabbard moles um they trickled in with a few different um, right, so colors the introduction was all because of so the introduction was all basically because of the bioactive vivarium movement exactly yeah. exactly yes yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but about three years ago there's a company in canada uh the lady who owns it is ashley gizan northern lights reptile she advertised a huge isopod list mm -hmm. and that's her first um when when she started uh sending that list from europe obviously yeah so yeah. we were kind of looking at the list and we kind of thought to ourselves should we take a take a chance should mm -hmm. we jump into some mm -hmm. of these larger species yeah. some of these more common species yeah, so, so we did like five species at the very yeah. beginning so that so that maybe we can kind of like see where we are in terms of like the care for them right because like especially if you you don't want to drop a huge amount of money and then get all of these animals right here where you're still kind of like you know you still have your your finger in it you know like you're yeah. still not head into it you don't know the whole thing yet or you have an idea but but you you're not really taking it into action yet because you, you don't have the hands-on especially the other species right like uh, the care level the differs between, yeah. well at least between Priscilio armadillidium and everything else the care level is different between some species and some it's very similar right? exactly exactly um, thankfully for, for us the first order that we did thankfully and not thankfully we were a little bit stupid when it came to or come to ordering mm -hmm. um some of the species that we ordered in that first order was bulabari um, we ordered expenses <laughs> we ordered uh, magnificus mm -hmm. off guy not very yeah. easy no, species we ordered the one basically that strikes us in terms of like the, the look yeah, it looks cool let's buy it yes yeah. yeah. you know and i think most people are that way it. unless they well, actually go exactly. to the show and have yeah. that conversation yeah. with someone right well i know one of the biggest problems that we had with that order though is well, we ordered two cultures of the expanses and everyone you know when you talk about expanses everyone was like keep them dry keep them dry keep yeah. them dry yeah so, there's no staple on like that's that's the the, the for me like that's the Starting up before in Isopod, the the worst thing is, is is a lot of people when you ask them in terms of questions and like how do you it's keep okay. them, how many, how much. I am very I'm very in terms of like numbers. I'm into numbers. Like I need to know a concrete number and like what to keep it into. Sixty percent, forty percent, eighty percent humidity, temperature. You know, like 78, 80 degrees, 74 degrees. I am very concrete on like in terms of like what, what temperature it is or what, what number it is. I'm a number freak. But um, nobody would like to give you any numbers. They The only thing that they tell you before is that don't keep it too hot, don't keep it too moist, don't keep it too dry. Yeah. Okay, what's the baseline on the moist and what's the baseline on the dry? Nobody wants to say anything yeah. whatsoever. So you, you go and do trial and error, right? Yeah. Our trial and error ended up costing us a few of the expenses because yep. when everyone said keep them dry you know you don't really have an idea on how how their moist area should be or yeah. vice versa so we ended up you know we didn't miss them very much we kept their dry area probably 25 30 percent of the enclosure we ended up having problems with desiccation like drying up because mm -hmm not enough moisture mm -hmm. now and then when when you when you overwater them they they do suffer again because they did it it was trial and error figuring yeah out they, the they always that needed moisture that's how they breathe and um and I think that's one of the only species like i've only ever had out of the 20 some species i've gotten from you guys there's only two that i haven't done well with one is expanses they have not done well i have none left and the only other one was that one that I got from you fairly early on. The one I was pretty excited about was spatula. spatula. Yeah. That is the only two. I still have the tubs. I still check the tubs. I still <laughs> maintain the tubs every week. Uh, but uh, if anything, I probably uh, overwatered what I would, would be my suggestion on what I've probably done. And I often look at, I go and maintain them every single week. And uh, I'm to now where I could go, I could maintain them every two weeks. And I don't think there'd be any change. You know, mm -hmm. I think the moisture can dry up a little bit more on certain species, particularly a lot of the, the Pacilio species, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, all the different types of genera, like uh, maybe, maybe Cheyenne, you can give us a quick rundown on all the different isopods in the world, more just kind of the different genera or the different groupings of isopods and how they all, how they're grouped together, so to speak. There's definitely a lot, um, at least the ones that we see commonly in the hobby is Porcilio armadillidium, 
and uh, Kobaras, those are the ones that people, you know, that we usually see more of. Mm -hmm. But there's also a Niscus, there's um, Trichoniscus, there, there's a menagerie of other different species mm -hmm. that are starting to gain popularity. There, there is, yeah. yeah. But, um, or the isopodus too, like the ones that are, you know, like the newer ones nowadays that are found in Thailand and Armadillo, stuff like that. Armadillos, no. yeah, there, Armadillos, there's yeah. a menagerie for sure. Yeah. Now, would you guys say each of you individually get to answer it yourselves? But like Ivan, what would you say is your favorite genera of isopods? Oh my know? god, that's really hard. Um, lately, I've been into um, the um, the isopoda ones lately um it's from the new caledonia like it's it's yeah. really they're very very caledonia yes yeah yeah what's well, the ones that um, you're mainly focused on is the new the newer ones that are coming out and you kind of spend so much time researching and finding them see if you can get them in europe or something like that mm -hmm. and they become a real strong focal point would you say out of, out of what you have in your collection currently of all the species you have not what's coming in this european shipment but what you currently have, what's your favorite? If you can only have one, what's your favorite? I would say maybe the um, what you call that? Uh, the big, huge, gigantic Hilaria. ones. Hilaria brevicornis. Okay. So I would say, to me, they're know, very fascinating. I, I don't know if they're quite like that, though. <laughs> no, they're huge. <laughs> Ivan has very <laughs> tiny hands. <laughs> yeah, they're super tiny. <laughs> and Cheyenne, what would be yours? That's easy. I'm I'm a huge Porcilio nut. I always have been. They're amazing, mm -hmm. at least when it comes to color variation, size. You have a huge range of size in general. You know, we've got Porcilio magnificus, for example, that's yeah. two, three inches alone. Bright they're, orange. <laughs> they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Yeah. I, you know, I know a lot of people kind of go towards Kubaris, but I like Kubaris, but Persilio, they've they've got my heart. There's mm -hmm. one species we've got coming in, hopefully in September, uh, Persilio butalundi, and they come from the same area as uh, Persilio sp morocco, which is another beautiful, undescribed, unfortunately, mm -hmm. isopod species. It's purple and it's got really nice orange skirting on it. But yeah, I, I love Persilio. I can't say enough about it. They're amazing. Well, I went uh, recently, I ordered, because uh, I want to bring my isopods out of the laundry room steel rack that they're on, and I want to do some changes in the fish room or the aquatic lounge, so the isopods are more a part of the, the whole area. So when I go live at home, then it can be a focal point, but it's also something that I could pull a tub right beside me out, and we could talk about it live on the live stream and have some more fun with it, get a bit more interactive. So my dear friend Sandy Moore from uh, from Florida, she gifted me and sent me that uh, surprise gift, the fan mail video I did with all those vents. So I have enough vid vents to do, I think, 24 tubs. Well, I got to figure out what kind of tubs I'm going to do. So to make it also even take it up one more notch even better, I went and ordered all these custom-made labels. Those are cool. All the species that I either have or species that I intend to have. Because, you know, yeah. I had to order, I think I had to order 20 of them or something like that to get the price break or something. But yeah. uh, I ordered the only one he didn't have was one of the Kubara species that we've got coming from Europe. So that's the oh. only but there was one other Persilio that he didn't have. So before I mention that one, Cheyenne, what would be your favorite Persilio species then? If Persilio is your favorite gender, what would you say is your favorite species? Suck and sink this. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I think, I think it's the one that you made up. I think it's the one that, because this guy oh, has never heard of it, he, has <laughs> found, he can't find a reference to it anywhere on the internet. He can't find a reference picture. He can't find anything. And and do you know which one I'm talking about, Cheyenne? Oh, God. Don't make it. Okay. Brasilio, I'm going to, I hope I butchered this thing. Oh, God. Um, spin a penis. Spidey penis, right? Spin a penis, buddy. I don't know the problem. Totally made up. It's. <laughs> <laughs> the funny story behind it, um, we got it probably a year ago, and um, one of the guys we've gotten a lot of ice pods from, he's absolutely amazing. Um, I, he sent us his list, and he was like, okay, so if there's anything you want for him, check it out. What do you think? And I'm going down through the list, and I'm like, please tell me that's the wrong name for that. And it ends up, you know, Priscilio Spinipinius, and I'm like, is this an actual name for it? And he's like, 100%. I'm like, 
I think the name. I think the name that we we've translated to in, in North America. I think it's it, it's spelt incorrectly. I don't think. I, I I think like what you say. It's spin it. I think that's correct. But instead yeah. of it having an e saying penis, I think it's actually penis. I think it should be an i. Yeah. yeah. For Latin, I think it should be an i. So I'd be spin a penis. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Still, Sorry about that. Like, I was still, nobody can find any reference of it whatsoever. So, if yeah. I do get them down the road, and the only reason I want them is because I think they'd be funny to do a video. But uh, they're, they're beautiful ice buds in themselves, though. They remind me of Armadillidium gastroi, just in porcilio form. Mm -hmm. with that black gastroi is a huge. They get yes, multiple, they're massive. Beautiful little armored tanks. <laughs> they are. Yeah. They're amazing, though. You know. When we, um, there were one species that we got in the beginning very much was Armadillidium granulatum, and we looked at the Armadillidium gestroi because everyone, you know, granulatum is a is a massive ice spot in itself, but it's a big species, and we're like, no, gestroi can't be bigger. And then yeah. we got our gestroi, and we're like, this is as big as my thumb. They're huge. <laughs> when we got them, and then they, they were they were saying that it's just a sub adult. Um, we're like, holy moly, the sub adult from that one right there it's looks massive. like adults from the other one. I was like, yeah, they look like VW beetle bugs. Exactly. <laughs> They're huge. Well, I know the granulatum that I have from you. I, when you go to pick up the piece of cork and it's like you need support, it's that heavy. It's so incredibly overpopulated with young, but I don't have a lot of adults. It's like, I, it's like the adults came in, they bred their brains out and died of exhaustion. <laughs> We noticed that a bit with our granulatum culture, at least with the granulatum. Um, when there's so much concentration of them. Uh, yeah. they, so many they, of them. They yeah. do call... Um, you get a crash. Yeah, you, yeah. They, you, you get a crash because there's so much there's so much um, waste products that is being produced in that. And if you don't have that much ventilation... Well, the nice thing... Really yeah. The nice thing about a lot of the isopods is they will somewhat self-regulate their population. I've noticed yeah. in my uh, the original three cultures that I got from you guy were you guys were uh, they were all three Priscilio species surprise uh, there was Hoffman Sagai thriving for me it's it's it, it would probably be my absolute favorite one that I have and it's one that I love working with Paisley on my daughter because it's such a large substantial isopod like when it crawls on your arm you know it's like you're holding something you notice this yeah. And the other, the other two that I had from you originally were Priscilio Hassii bright yellow, which is still a favorite. Yeah. It's super prolific. And the other one was uh, Ornatus high yellow. They don't they don't intrigue me as much. I've had people talk about. It. I've had comments on my videos says, "Oh, I love your Ornatus and stuff like that." And I'm like, "Okay." Out of my entire collection, those would be my least favorite. And I, I honestly can't tell you why. They are the ones I've shared with you that are throwing different mutations. I've got these weird chocolate colored ones and everything like that, but they don't they don't really do anything for me. But the Hassii one, the reason I was bringing this up, is the Hassii I have noticed occasionally on the past couple of weekends that my daughter says, oh, dad, there's a dead one. There's another dead one. There's another dead oh, one. You know, and, and I think it's just they're self-regulating their population because you pick up yeah. the wood, the whole surface is covered. Mm -hmm. Definitely when you have a bigger, lot of them will do that. Yeah, when yeah. you have bigger cultures or at least cultures with the... Um, how do I say it? Uh, more individuals in it. You definitely got to replace, you know, your because they're detritivores, right? They break down, mm -hmm. you know, decomposing yeah. organic matter. You want to make sure you're still topping back up with leaf litter and or new ABG because as mm -hmm. they break down that materials, if they break it all down completely, there's nothing left mm -hmm. to them, right? And, and, and it's it's like kind of like with all the other animals out there, right? Like uh, a species will only will only um, I guess multiply if if the environment provides it you know a space to multiply with when and and um and nutrition to to multiply with and everything allow them to grow allow them to grow you know like but but you'll hit a cap same thing with all these species like humans too in general you know like i mean you will hit a cap that that the thing couldn't sustain it anymore and that's where you see crashes yeah I'm I was, I, I'm absolutely surprised in the one year that I've been doing them that some of the cultures how often I have to add handfuls of leaf litter. Yeah. Like I, I thought I had you know enough to step up another twenty cultures should I need sort of thing because it's not like you can collect leaf litter in the, in the summertime, right? No, so I, I had that stuff and I'm adding a lot. I wish you could. <laughs> And not just that, but the, the sheer amount of how much calcium they will go through. You know, like on those those cuddle bones, like I gave you a bag of those cuddle bones. I thought, you know, I'm going to have a lifetime supply. And like, no, they're going no. through them really not at all. fast. We buy um, 10 pounds. While we're there, uh, I, I just... Five pounds. I 
think Sorry? they're breaking out a little bit. Thanks. They're breaking out a little bit. <laughs> Uh, Wally asked the question, Cheyenne's favorite Presalio. You just asked you to repeat it. It was Succinctus, correct? Yeah, Succinctus. I might be mispronouncing yeah. it wrong, and I do apologize on that, uh, but uh, Succinctus. It's, I love Expanses. They're an absolutely beautiful, beautiful species, but Succinctus, it it's kind of a one-up for me. It's got the, seem it's a like a hybrid between uh, like Hoffman Sagai and Expanses. It's got the colors of Hoffman yeah. Sagai, but the pattern. The, the contrast, I think, is what she she's it's um, into. It. It's hard to see it in photos, but when you see them in real life, the um, on the Peron with the you know, because on the Peron you've got the um, you know the white blotches in each of the segments. It's almost purplish for mm -hmm. the base color if you see it in real life. It's it's hard to photograph, but it's a very soft purple hue to the body. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. the one uh, one of my favorites that I've gotten recently uh, with them, we did that order from Europe together. I haven't seen any mankai from mine, uh, but you guys, I think you said you has, was the, and I know it's a relatively common one to some people, but to me it's new and I find it fascinating is that uh, the magic potions, the, the magic, vulgar yeah. magic potions we got from Europe. I just love how they, they're almost translucent. These all these it looks like they're, they're cool. painted from underneath. I just love that. And they they almost remind me of um, how do I say it? Like, like little marshmallows. Those, yeah, like one of those balls that like people like squishes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Kids that, you can see through, that you can yeah. see through inside and with yeah. like a bunch of different colors in there, like yellows and red and that's what no, they look they're, like. They're cool. They're so cool. Are yours producing already? Yeah, we've got a bit. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it, it takes time too, though, right? Yep. But now, now, we're, now that we're kind of getting to that point, why don't we talk about the basics of culture? How Species Canada does their culture of their isopods, and then maybe give them a little tiny tips and tricks as to what's different between, say, this particular species we got to do this, or this particular species you should do this. You know, kind of just kind of give a rundown in regards to how you guys do your culture for yeah. your isopod collection. So most of our bins, we actually use, uh, depending on where you are. So in Canada, we've got Home Depot. I think the United States has Home United Depot. United States well. has the, uh, I think, the HDX or whatever yeah. is the brand name. It's just a, a very, very square. It's 19.4 um, liters. Yeah, exactly. That's what we yeah. use for all yeah. of our it's main It's a very cultures. square um, uh, tub or bin that uh, can be stacked pretty good. And then there's about a half inch all over in the very top to actually leave a space for us to drill around and uh, put some ventilation in the yeah, top so and the front and the two sides as well. Yeah, so the ventilation usually will put a big gap in the front of ventilation. Mm -hmm. It will take and the whole front yeah, the whole as a front. ventilation, maybe like half of it on the very top. And then uh, the two sides gonna have uh, at least 40% on both sides. Ventilation. of ventilation that is closer to the front and then no ventilation and the uh 60 yeah, percent of the side yeah. and then uh, all the way out to the back and there's no ventilation whatsoever same thing with the drilling holes on the very top we don't do 50 percent from from one end to the other end and we do only 50 percent from the from the middle mid, mid half to the front so basically what i've been saying <laughs> um so the front half of the bin We've got uh, ventilation cut with a wood burner, and then we'll put insect mesh on the front. Mm -hmm. And with the sides, basically half of the, you yeah. know, the side in the front will be ventilation on each side. And we'll also put a little bit of holes along the um, the ledge. Not the ledge, like, yeah. The, yeah. Um, we, we, use, uh, we use smaller than uh, what you can get in the market right now. I think it's uh, an eighth of an inch in terms of like, uh, in terms of like the, the size of the... Uh, the ventilation, but we use uh, way smaller than that. We use one sixteenth of an inch, and you can get the micro mesh nowadays on anything, and that basically limits. You have a lot of decomposing matter inside, and um, you you have fungus nuts that come in and out, and um, when you have isopods, you tend to breed fungus nut as well at the same time. But the only way for them to not for you to kind of like stop them from from doing. For, 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 for breeding anymore is for them to not get into a place that they can actually start eating and then breeding at the same time. So having a super s small mesh, but still allow ventilation in is, is a really good idea. It helps at least with keeping the fungus, the fungus gnats in control. Um, when it comes to substrate, as we all know with isopod keepers, your substrate is extremely important. Mm -hmm. We like to use a, 
a basic mix. So we'd use fir bark. We like to add sphagnum charcoal, black earth soil mix, which mm -hmm. is basically a hummus, you know, like decomposed you hummus. We, we do, uh, we do um, a little bit of, uh, of um, uh, worm casting, worm as, casting well. as well. Yeah, yeah, we do worm casting. We'll mix in, so what we'll do generally is we'll take a, about a cup to two cups of leaf litter per bin and we'll crunch it up in our hands and we'll also mix that into the substrate yeah. as well. Yeah. Kind of gives it a little bit, um, how do I say it, volume to the mix. Because mm -hmm. as soon as those leaf litter that is in the bottom start to decompose, it will actually go through in the uh, in the substrate mix that you have in the top layer. Gives them something to use yeah. for sure. Because um, they do eat everything, like they do they do go through everything and after a while you'll see your your substrate being consumed and like things that they actually start picking onto and um and then the whole almost the whole top layer is going to get covered with with frass yep. and um and uh, a few and, yeah. that may not know frass is basically the fancy word for poo <laughs> <laughs> that's isopod poop my daughter knows it well <laughs> But um, once we have our basic substrate mix, one thing we've recently started adding to our mix, which we've had really good results with, it's a brand called Sea Soil. It's basically, um, how do I say it, fur mulch that's been decomposed mm -hmm. over with a couple of years with yeah. fish emulsion. And it's been absolutely amazing on our mix so far. So we've had good success with that. Where do you access that product? I've never even heard of that. Where do you access that product? We we do get it from um, like we order it from Amazon and stuff like that, and uh, you can get them like they, there's um there's a place in Vancouver that gets it most of the time. Yeah, there's also a local place to us, um, Sage Gardens, where you can purchase it. Yep. Okay, I see Kyle is most Jordanella has mentioned it down here in the chat that it's sea soil and it's composed yeah. uh, composted fish and forest waste. Sage Garden yeah. sells it, so yeah. they do. it's available locally to us in Manitoba. Yeah. But uh, sea soil is that a brand name? It is a brand. Sea soil is a brand name. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But cool. um, we've recently started adding that, and we've had great success with mm -hmm. it so far. And you can get them in the bigger bags online, like the one that. Uh, um, which you call that uh, Sage Garden cell, I think it's like yeah. 15 pounds or uh, 10 kilograms or 15 kilograms or something like that. Yeah. You can get them on like 30 or 40 kilograms yeah. as well. Yeah, on a pallet. We've also, in our mixes, we've also started adding, um, so we usually do this with just the Kabars, which is ground limestone. Yes. But we've started doing it with all of our cultures as well, just as ground it doesn't corals. hurt. Yeah. It's a good additive to add. Yeah, crushed corals, yeah. Yeah, crushed coral, even uh, ground limestone works yeah. pretty good. You guys have gone and paused. Oh. You're still there? Yep. Oh, are you yeah. yep. are you froze. <laughs> now that's now that's your basic mix that you use kind of so it's it's somewhat of a modified, like they use most people talk about using an ABG yeah. mix. So it's somewhat of modified that. And yeah. the reason that we do this in Canada is the modified ABG mix is one of the main components of ABG mix is tree fern. And that is a CITES product. It is. <laughs> yeah. We can't so that here. Getting tree fern into Canada in any quantity that would be in cost effective way is very, very challenging. So a lot of uh, people up here are not using tree fern. So we have to substitute yeah. something that has similar consistency. And really, what is tree? Tree fern is just another organic item, but it provides air spaces and you know structure within the in the soil structure right, all humidity as well at the same time yeah. Yeah. chopping yeah. up little twigs and sticks and fur bark and those type of things yeah. are going to provide yeah. similar type of benefits and so we're just modifying that mix a little yeah. bit yeah well what, what we do is we just add more fur bark into the uh, the mix yeah. add a little bit more charcoal and depending on the species that you know like if, if our medallion we do add a little bit more sphagnum moss yeah just to yeah. keep up with the high humidity um but for example our basic basic persilio setup would be the substrate mix. We'd have our moist area, which we'd also put sphagnum on top mm -hmm. around the moist area. I tend to put more sphagnum moss than I guess people do. Yeah, um, but they do consume it. So like do, you, you yeah. don't have to worry about putting too much in there because um, they, they'll consume it anyway. They'll, so break, like it they, they'll break it down. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, then I'll use bark pieces. So most of the bark pieces we get, they're oak, poplar, birch, mm -hmm. any sort of, um, you know, old fallen decomposing, decomposing. Yeah. yeah they really break down i take it home and i know i've seen on chats all over the place on facebook and social media places but when i go and i'll harvest like behind me i went in the cow pasture into the forest in the winter time 
and he had huge log piles of stuff. And I just ripped off all large slabs of bark and I brought it all home and it sat in the garage, but I still honestly go through the same process of baking it. I just don't want to run the risk. I don't know why people want to say, oh, you don't need to do that. Well, I just don't know. Uh, I don't want to run the risk. Why? Yeah, there, there's a lot of risks that you can actually, yeah. you know, like, I mean, cross contaminate and stuff like that, too. Well, you could also bring stuff in you don't want. Yeah. Um, for example, a while ago, we um, went and collected some bark. And you got jiggers barks, everywhere. Jiggers. The bark was also full of ants, yeah. too. Yeah, full of ants, yeah. 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 Ants, yes. jiggers, like, they're, they're red um aphids that are that, that do feed on um, on uh manka it's like small isopods that are babies well, don't feed um, i've heard of uh people often using live moss adding live moss into into the tank particularly with like kubara species and stuff and i'm like i ain't putting no live moss i've pulled off a rotting log in the forest directly into my culture of some <laughs> animal like that mm -hmm. no it ain't happening that that stuff is still going to be i may not bake it in the oven because that'll just turn it into powder <laughs> it, will, it will basically <laughs> just like dry it out on an on a hot day on a nice sunny day and just bake it outside until it's dry and then i'll use it sure they'll still break it down right <laughs> mm -hmm. but like i mean if we're if you're using um if you're using any anything to do with uh live moss or whatever and you want to keep it live um that is the only way to do it is to to weather it you know but um or, or put it in really submerge it in water and yep. then you let everything stay out. You let everything kind of like float in the very top. But uh, if you're not going to use the, the live moss as, as being live and then see if it's going to grow inside, what you can do as well is you can boil it. And then it'll basically get rid of everything. You might yep. end up killing moss too. You will, you will end up, that's why I said, like you will end up killing the moss. Like well, me drying it on a sticky sheet in the sun is going to kill it too, right? So exactly. you're, still, yeah. you're still providing, it's all it is, is honestly, it's this isn't media. This is actually a food source for them. Yeah, that's it is. Fun, right? Exactly, and, it's it's gonna ha have a hard time growing into into that with with no uh, with no sort of uh, adequate lighting and everything like that. So. I notice uh, there's a comment here from an individual dragon layer. He's asking about aspen. He uses aspen in his uh, his carpet python cage. So I'm assuming he's talking about either shredded or chipped aspen, yeah. like we use in a hamster or snake cage. Is that a, is that usable? It's it's a hardwood, so I don't see it affecting yeah. anything. You can definitely mix it into a substrate mix. Just add volume, just to give them something else to break down. It's yeah. not going to hurt them, especially mm -hmm. being a hardwood, softwood. You might. Yeah, aspen is a little bit. Of, it's in a bit, a little bit of soft, softer wood. Like it's not. It's, it's okay, not though. pure, pure hardwood. But, but it aspen, doesn't have any of the phenol. It doesn't have any of the stuff. No, the resinous no products. No, no, like because most of them are clean. Like when you buy aspen, most of them are, are dried out. So all, all the uh, all the. Um, it's a hardwood. Uh, all, all of the uh, dangers and the phenols and stuff like that will actually already aerate out, so you don't have to worry about anything that is still in the wood there. Yeah. They can just be decomposed. Yeah. Now, what other now? So we've kind of gone over the how you build your culture, how you build your containers, your different types of mixes and stuff that you do. Now, the next step would be with the feeding and the variety of diet and kind of the routine. You know, how do you water them? What kind of routine yeah. do you do to take care of them? What do you feed them? So other than, you know, because you get your substrate mix for them to break down, that's going to be their main food source. Supplemental food source we've also given to our cultures is fish flakes or mm -hmm. fish pellets. Those work mm -hmm. great. We've also given Ripashi gel products. morning woods. Yeah, morning wood. Everybody uses morning yeah. wood for uh, a good reason. Burger from Ripashi works pretty good yeah. too as well. Both um, morning wood and Ripashi. Yeah. Uh, morning wood and burger, sorry, can be either given um, dry or, or in the gel form. Yeah. But we find out that the the dry form is a lot better because it, it gives you more um, uh, length of time that you can actually have it on the. But they like it as a gel. Kitchen. They like it as a gel, but they dry out so quick. The we I also do uh, for the Rapashi products because I have the reptiles and then I have a bunch of insect eating fish like different live bears and stuff. So I often use morning wood bug burger, and I have another <laughs> one that is is based out of uh, like bug larvae. And I often will make a batch and just mix them all together. <laughs> oh, yeah, it looks good. Like, I don't want to make it and put it in the fridge because yeah. I'll forget about it in the fridge. And my wife will be, what is this? You know, mm -hmm. so I'll make it up, but I just feed all the isopods on Saturday morning. And whatever's left, I feed all the fish. <laughs> yeah. Waste no on right? Oh, exactly. exactly. Uh, another thing we've had really good success with is bee pollen. Bee pollen. We've actually had some isopods fight over it. Yeah. I remember a couple of weeks ago, we went and fed bee pollen to uh, our Hoffman Sega culture, and there was two big males, and they were grasping the one piece, both of them. They, they were just pulling it apart, and I was like, 
really, guys? It's hilarious. Well, the thing um, I find the coolest about Hoffman Say Guy, and I'm, I'm sure it's the same with a lot of the larger uh, Persilios the same way. Yeah. Maybe it is the same way with a lot of the other smaller species. We just don't see it to the same no, way. No, they're not but Hoffman Say Guy has been very well documented from being me being an aquarist and a lot of the people there in the chat are all aquarists is this isopod is like keeping a pair of cichlids. So when they breed, they defend their offspring. They, they take do, care yeah. of their offspring. The female actually uh, holds the offspring on her in her pouch, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah. them, they take care of them. They watch them and they're very, very aggressive. So it's like a male cichlid. He's defending the territory and he's fighting for it. So, that's really, really impressive. That was the one thing that really endeared me to that particular species was that actual aspect. You know, the funny thing is, going back to when you talk to ice pods with the general public, people don't really associate parental care with isopods, with insects in general. Oh, yeah, but, insect in general yeah. but it's amazing that they do exhibit it, and people are gobsmacked when you tell them that. <laughs> people don't the bears, believe you. The bears is a really, really good um, They're good birds too. Yeah, yeah. They, they protect their brood most of the time too as well like they keep them really close to them and At you can see yeah, you can see that yeah. the babies actually eat what they eat now what else do you guys do for uh your different routines like uh, is there any other types of uh like a special watering do you have a routine that you do for your ice pods are you checking them every day once a week once a month how are you doing not every day. Um, we usually check them once a week once when a week. we uh, do the cultures. So we do the cultures once a week at least for re-moisturizing, feeding, yeah. everything like that. Um, at least from what I found, the more you bother them, the worse it is. You know, you don't want to keep pestering them every day, checking them. Especially it, if they're trying to establish them. Exactly. I did that when we first got into isopods. I was looking at them every day. I was like, oh, these are awesome. These are awesome. Oh, my God. And it was not good in the end. Yeah, they, they, they usually don't want to get bothered. No, uh, no. Yeah. So we leave them, we'll generally leave them alone. Um, even when we do the once a week check, we don't really pull anything apart. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we don't even lift enclosure. most of the logs. Like no. we, we let the logs just stay there. We provide our water, we provide our food and, and uh, we provide anything that we use like in terms of uh, uh, vegetables that we give. Or, butternut squash is yeah, a big favorite. Yeah, butternut squash is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, carrots or anything like that, you know, and then, um, and then yams too are really good yeah but uh we provide that we just do our watering we don't even water them directly because watering them directly isn't really really good because it, they, they, it flooded them so much they try to to cope with the uh the amount of water that is mm -hmm. in there so what we do is we just water around the corners and the side like yeah. we we let the water kind of like go into the very back wall of of the uh the um the tub and then I just do a really light misting on the very top just to actually moisten the uh, the rest of the areas. But yeah. we we yeah. uh, we very like you have to be very very careful in terms of like how much you water in terms of how where the water hits yeah. and everything like that. Yeah. You don't want to hit. I, that. I think that's yeah. been the the biggest factor for me in in my errors of culture is the fact that uh, you check on it and you water and if you water too heavy and you come back a week later and it's still pretty wet. You watered too much, yeah. right? Exactly. You, it, you don't want it to ever dry out, you yeah. know, because that's just as dangerous. But you you want it to still have some substance. But this that's thinks the biggest challenge with the pandemic that's hit with here is <laughs> they live at home every single day. I'm working yeah, watering everything. everything. <laughs> We're going to do the isopods on Saturday. On Monday morning, she's going, Dad, we should go check the isopods. <laughs> how, do you tell, how do you tell a four year old you can't go check the isopods because they need to yeah. be left alone? It's challenging. Yeah, you can't yeah. say no. You yeah, really can't. Exactly. No. You gotta show it. Like especially, you gotta feed her passion, right? Like yeah. No, no, no. We start thinking. Then we start thinking. <laughs> right? It kind of taps out at about halfway to fifteen. <laughs> right? So then we separate. Okay, this day we do these ones. Now we now yeah. can do ice pods twice a week. <laughs> That's good. That's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> somebody, uh, somebody in the chat uh, asked uh, Acadia Territory asked whether or not you guys have ever, and I answered for you. So I'm sure you have, and I know uh, our friend Dan Fryer has done the same. Is uh, feeding snake sheds? We have. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we yeah. definitely do have a lot of sheds that you know from our snakes that we accumulate. And why throw it out when you can just throw it into your yeah. they, they do. The, the, uh, they do actually consume them. You know, like some of them they really them. really quick. Some of them, Persilio, tend to consume them. Like really quick. More so than armadillidium, we yeah. found the main cultures that will distribute the sheds to are things like our Lavis, our Scabber, Porcelio SP Barbate, Arnatus, even the Hoffmans. 
my God, they all go crazy for them. But when we distributed them into armadillidium, armadillium or even yeah. Kubaris, even concentrated cultures of, of armadillium, armadillium. Yeah. they still don't really go through it as well. Not as, as much as yeah. they'll, they'll go for more of the leaf litter, the uh, yeah. moss. Yeah. Well, I'm just about to do my harvest uh, from the manure pile at the back of my property. The stinging nettle is abundant. Oh my God. <laughs> and instead of last year when I did it, I went into it, I put gloves on and I harvested individual leaves. I ain't doing that this year. I'm literally going out there with a machete, cutting down all the plants, throwing them in the wheelbarrow, bringing them back, drying them in under the sun, and then I'm just going to cut them up in pieces and throw them in bags. Yeah, this is like a chunk of it done. <laughs> Instead of getting your hands hurt or anything like oh, exactly. that. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Then... Once but once it's dried, like once you've dried it in the sun, it's like uh the the, the, the little spines, they're they're almost the diameter of a hair. They fall mm -hmm. off or yeah. they're, they're 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 rendered useless. Yeah. Now you have uh, mo a lot of the people that don't know you that may be in the chat is one of your favorite animals, and Cheyenne's definite favorite animal is the thra uh, Thrasops Jackson eye. And we did a video on them, and that I called it the animatronic robot licorice <laughs> snake or something like that. They're very visual, yep. And, uh, she tells me that this snake smells like a candy shop. It smells like licorice all the time. But it's a venomous snake that is as venomous as a boom slang. So we didn't take it out and put it up to our noses. But every time we get a fresh shed from this thing, apparently it smells like a, a candy store in species Canada. But have you ever given the isopods a treat of a Thrasops Jackson eye shed? You know, to be honest, Mace, yeah, I, mean, I haven't found, well, I've given a few and yeah. they still, they have no preference, no. unfortunately. The shed so. is a shed. Yeah. So now we take it to the next level. Have you tried giving the isopods, say, uh, Bassett's assorted licorice all sorts. No, no. <laughs> you know they probably eat that too. So. <laughs> well, they're, they're they're basically like uh, they're basically mushrooms of the of the. Exactly. Are, they're they're basically are. mushrooms, right? You break yeah. stuff down. They're the kind of the bottom layer. Anything that hits that bottom layer, their role is to break stuff down. That's what they do. Yeah. And the fact that they're they're colorful, a lot of the species are extremely colorful. They're yeah. fascinating to watch and observe. They're easy to care. There's no danger in any aspect whatsoever. You, if you had your child, if Finn was sitting there and accidentally went in the culture, grabbed one and ate it, you don't have any fear. You don't have no. to worry about anything. And then, that and some of them actually are, are um, act as uh, antacid, like uh, like your regular. Well, there is um, um, when you read about armadillo officinalis. You know, you read a few things. They were exactly like Ivan said. Used it as an antiacid, like a for heartburn. Yeah, yeah. And people actually, you know, like eat them, and then they they work like your regular tums that you get, but they're not. not just doing that. But. <laughs> you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna have a tums. <laughs> I'm not gonna go to the basement. Tums are in the hall closet. Isopods are downstairs. Now, if I'm downstairs maintaining the isopods or fish room or doing laundry or something like that, and I do have a need, I'm still going to go upstairs and get a <laughs> <laughs> That is probably no, one of my daughter's favorite ones right account, now. Okay. From you guys, that's probably one of her favorite ones right now, besides the, the, the Lavis types, is that armadillo, armadillo one, uh, aficionalis. Yeah. She loves that it's it's the very obvious one that people associate with isopods yeah. that rolls up into that tight ball. Mm -hmm. and the minute it doesn't make a sound too. Yeah, I believe the, the term is, um, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, I do apologize, uh, stragulate. Yeah, but, they can make, uh, uh, make a you, low humming. When you, exactly, like I've said, when you stress them out, not that I recommend stressing them out, of course, but they make a very... Like a, not a, almost like a hissing sound. Like a hissing, dogs. low humming sort of sound. Another species that uh, we've noticed also do that is Armadillidium espanoli or Armadillidium sp marbidalized. Marbidalized. They've yeah. also made sounds too, yeah. Yeah. which is pretty interesting. And you can you can see them when they do make those like audible sounds. As you can see, their body retract. Like the, it, it kind of shivers. It almost. shivers. Yeah. It's almost like they're kind of like forcing something out. But you can you can see how they do. When when they're gonna about to to uh, to make the sound or whatever, you can see the body, how the body reacts. I bet you if you amplified it and recorded it, it'd probably be something like, "Leave me alone." <laughs> <laughs> no, <Don't> eat me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
what is the best tasting isopod? There you go. Well, I think oh, Ivan already answered that is the, yeah, the much. saltwater isopod. This is absolute <laughs> favorite. Yeah. Oh, uh, Wally from Supreme Gecko asked earlier, and we didn't get to it. He says, any differences in regards to the setup or substrate that you guys use that is beneficial for, say, Kubaris? Because the Kubaris, for most intense purposes, most of the species that we're seeing, and Kubaris for Canada, Wally, is actually in its infancy because, like, there hasn't yes. been very many species available. Uh, that's going to change pretty mm -hmm. soon. But uh, you're talking about mostly species of Thailand and Vietnam, Asian, or, uh, uh, Asian uh, origin, and most of them live within cave type structures. So very, very limestone or calciferous based. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that we're going to keep them in exactly the same type of tub and the same type of a mix doesn't really make sense. But for some know. people it works very successful and some people it doesn't. Yeah. What would you guys suggest? Um, right now, what we're currently started to do is we, um, we, we, we do have an RO unit at the facility. Um, and uh, I do have a alkalinity booster. Like a, it's basically another form that I can bypass through my water source, and it goes through this. Um, it 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 basically makes my, the water um, um, alkaline. Like it, it, it's it. Uh, yeah, we talked about this earlier. Yeah. And um, and uh, so now the the pH and down right there is now around nine point five, and that's what we uh, we basically give to some of the uh cubarius that are actually found in caves yeah and but um, when it comes to substrate and that generally for the cubarius we'll add more powdered limestone or even limestone chunks mm -hmm. yep. we also have added um, pieces of coral mm -hmm. like the sand too the as well same sand thing. as well just to kind of give that more substance to it because mm -hmm. they're not the real you know, key is that makes the that makes the when you had a bunch of forest litter and products that you would find on a forest floor the acidic level of that 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 soil or substrate is already low and then yeah. you had animals that produce an organic waste product such as frass that that acidity level is going to continue to decline it will it will especially especially at the base of mixture nowadays that the people use to are peat moss Yep. And 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 Very acidic already. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so so um, the only way that uh, us keepers can actually increase it is by providing the ones that are actually has the properties to increase the the, the pH level higher. Yeah. And uh, for us, the only way that we can maintain it is by providing um, uh, a really high pH uh, water for those other. Ones. The other factor is all those elements like adding the calcium, the limestone, the you know any of those type of products that we're adding to the substrate. It's not a matter of increasing, it's a matter of stabilizing. Yeah. It's balancing and it's stabilizing so that the, the soil itself is not going to crash and become very acidic. Because I think any of the, the long-term keepers of Kubaris, and I only have one, so I'm definitely not authority whatsoever in it whatsoever. But the way my brain works is in a very uh, scientific way and I do a lot of reading. And I think anybody that's gonna have any crashes with stuff like Kubaris is because their soil or their substrate or their what media is eventually going to crash and become very acidic as the animals more and more produced, more waste products, that substrate's going to crash. Yeah. That's what, that's the reason why a lot of, um, especially with around like later on when you have a culture that is staying on the tub for like, let's say six or eight months or whatever. And you know that there is the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the pH level or the, the, uh, the level of the pH is going down already in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, Especially as you know, they've been in that tub for a yeah. long time. So you make sure that the very back structure. end are a little bit more wet. So they, they go more towards the back end and then you just take out the front soil and then you can replace it with something else. With yeah. a sifter. Yeah, with a sifter, obviously. Yeah. yeah, they're a little bit more valuable to just, you know, oh, we'll just take handfuls of them. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you definitely want to keep replacing as things get broken down because if you don't, you're just, you're running into problems. You're running into a potential crash if you're not, you know, re-replacing new substrate, new things for them to, you know, feed on and break down and utilize. Yeah. I've seen on, uh, I've, I've never seen it available in Canada, but I know there's one particular substrate soil mix, garden soil mix that I was using at home for plants. And I, 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 for some reason, I ended up having to go on their website because something I wanted to use that soil for, I wanted to ensure that it didn't have any uh, encapsulated fertilizers or added products and stuff to it. And when I was on their website, they actually listed that they had a bat guano based soil. Oh, wow. That's pretty amazing. I, that would be wonderful to have, particularly for the Kubara species, because 
Sorry, and if you're in a cave, there's probably not a lot of openings is, in the cave. No, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. There isn't. There's a lot of. Uh, you're going to be walking in there. something else, hypothetically. <laughs> you're going to be walking in Guam, and yeah, pretty much yeah. that's about all there's going to be yeah. in there. Dead bats, dead whatever yeah. that is trapped in there, snakes or whatever that is trapped in there, anything. Yeah. But yeah, going back to the question when it comes to, you know, differing care for different species, for sure, you know, talking about the cabaris even, you're not going to set up a cabaris like you're going to set up potentially Priscilla or Armadillidium. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even the soil density and the soil, like how, what, what the soil consistency is very different from each of those ones. One thing that you know, when you talk or when you read care sheets or you talk to some people going back to the moisture levels, everyone tells you keep them, you know, for let's go back to Priscilla, for example, keeping Priscilla dry, dry, dry. And everyone tells you keep them dry, keep them dry, keep them dry. That can be, you know, how do I say it? Interpreted different for each it's person. Misleading. It's very yeah. misleading. Yeah. It is very and misleading. And I think when it comes down to that for any of the species, you really got to look at how your house is too, right? It's every Everyone's house is different levels of humidity, different temperatures. So you kind of have to adjust accordingly to that as well. You know, I may keep my cultures a certain moisture level, which may not work for you guys, you know, mm -hmm. vice versa. And every, every, every time, depending on the size of bench you use, like I mimicked basically when I started, you were my mentor and you still, you guys still are somewhat, but when I, I basically mimicked my containers identical to the way you did, mm -hmm. when I did that for certain ones, it works really, really well. I find for the Basilios in the fact that it's got lots and lots of ventilation all along the sides and everything like that. It works really, really good. But I found for certain other species, if I would leave it for a full week, it would dry out. And I think what's happened in change as I've modified my care is I'm actually getting heavier handed with the water. And again, I'm using RO water like you mentioned as well. RO water, for the people that may not know, is reverse osmosis water. It's a special made water. If you do not have reverse osmosis uh, water accessible at your home, you can go to a grocery store and buy distilled water, which is steam yeah. distilled, or you can buy uh, reverse osmosis in a jug, and then you can make it yourself. Would you recommend people using spring water, if they could buy spring water, because it would have mineral content to it? It would, yeah, that's, that's the reason why we don't really recommend using RODI water. It's too right. pure. Um, it's too pure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You still want a little bit of minerals, you still want the uh, TES in there for sure, you don't want... You don't want zero completely. Yeah. yeah. And I know that now that I'm going to go and switch from those large vents, I made smaller vents just because I just thought the containers were a little flimsy. And the containers that I've made vents different hold moisture longer, obviously, right? And as you say, my house, my laundry room is going to be different than the main room. And my, my house temperature is going to dictate the humidity level. The ventilation is going to dictate. In your facility, yeah. all your isopods are all set up in, in this giant rack in giant rows. And you have air current that moves through your building in a very set way. So mm -hmm. there's air current through them a set way. So yeah. no matter what the care culture, no matter where you're buying your isopods, be it from uh, from Species Canada or for in the U.S., you're buying from different sources yeah. there, such as Wally at Supreme Gecko. These are general rules that they can tell you in regards to the care for that animal. But ultimately, it's going to be up to you, the caregiver, to adapt it to your situations. Mm -hmm. As, as I've said, like, I, I get people all of a sudden keep asking me questions like I'm some sort of expert on isopods. I've only been doing this for a year. And as I've said, clearly, there's two species I have not been able to keep alive. And that was the expenses. And then the, what was the other one? The, the, uh, you know, the spatulas. The big gray ones that look like trilobites. The spatulas. I can't think of the name. I said yeah. it at the beginning. Spatula, that's the other one. You know, those two have been the two most challenging for me to keep. And will I do them again? I don't know. Down the road, we'll see. I like them, but there's also really cool stuff coming too. And I just don't have, I don't have a facility like you guys. And I'm pretty sure my wife is never going to appreciate the idea of an ice supply. There's always room for more. There like, is always room for more, for sure. Yeah. But yeah. no, definitely, you know, like you said, and, and like we touched on, look at how your home environment or mm -hmm. wherever you're keeping ice pods are is because you can go and you can read a care sheet and of course definitely you know use the general you know general porcelain care i'm delaying care, yeah. care, care but kind of you know look at how your home setting is or wherever the ice pods are and you may have to adjust accordingly to yeah. what you have for sure and, uh, and most of the time too as well like i mean a lot of people that don't realize is that when sometimes when they're setting up a new culture 
Uh, so you put in all your items, like you you needed like all the the, the, uh, the stuff for, for to make the, the substrate that you wanted. You water it a little bit so that the concentration of water and humidity in that in that um, in that mix is higher. So you put it on your you put it in your tub, and then you you add in your your leaf litter and everything that you needed for decorations and stuff that they can break down, and then you add in your isopods over top of it. What happened over time is that the humidity will get out and then the water moisture will come out of that. And if you're only watering, only on the sides and the corners and everything like that, what's gonna happen is the very middle will will, will stay dry. And the way that it dries out is from bottom up. Yeah. And then oh, what's gonna happen is, um, unless the, the side corners, that will stay dry in the very bottom. But what's gonna happen is you'll have, you'll be like, well, why, why my animals are dying? I'm still watering. I'm still putting in all this, um, I'm, I'm misting every day, I'm watering, but they're dying because the problem is is that the the uh, the moisture level that when you set it up and the moisture level a month after is very different from 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 both of them because because all that moisture that you put in the, that that mix when you're mixing it up is already evaporated. But you also even talked about uh, you know it's, it's a slightly different topic, but I remember you've talked about it many times that a lot of people that are get excited about certain species, particularly like the Kubaras and stuff, and they want to bring these animals in from overseas or even from different areas of the States. If they're coming from different elevations, it can often be a real factor for trying to get these new animals established in, in yeah. your home. Yeah, the it, takes, you it know, takes a while. The biggest thing I like to say, and from what we've noticed when we've done European orders, for example, we have the most die-offs in the first week as the animals are acclimating to their you know new environment elevation humidity temperature everything like that that first week is that's our crunch time you know that's when we'll lose the most and then the culture stabilizes and they're fine after that but that's a risk when you're buying from overseas or from america it's something that you have to take unfortunately and it's but one of the it's, ways of getting something new that's not here right Yes. Exactly. Exactly, and it takes time for them because those those guys are bred on that temperature and that humidity, on that on that climate or that environment, and then now those are bred through generation and generation. You know, you never know if there might be F three or F four already of that type that they're sending you, and then when you get it, they're already acclimated to that, and then you have another different type of of of, of um, environment. It's a shock. They'll shock. They'll, Plus, they'll you, get you've got shipping stress on top but, of it. When they're a week in transit, it's a it's a lot on them. And if they're not, you know, if they're not packed properly, that also contributes to issues mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Less humidity they put on the, the containers oh, yeah, so that they're packing. If you're going to ship tropical fish anywhere, you what we call clean them out for 24 hours, 48 hours. That means you don't feed them. You give them good water and you don't feed them. When you're mm -hmm. talking about an ice pod, that's you know this little tiny thing. And maybe it doesn't have anything. Maybe it dies because of humidity. Maybe it dies because of stress. Maybe it dies because it has no food. There's so many other factors that are, we don't know, right? You can't yeah. ship them. That's one of the factors. You have an animal that eats vegetation and decaying vegetation. You can't ship it into Canada, an agricultural country, with a bunch of leaves in the container. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> You're going to have some problems if you do that. We'll have a problem getting the isopods in, but the leaves are definitely going to be yeah. around. <laughs> But what it is, the, uh, the, they crunch up uh, paper towels and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, a lot of people do. Um, at least uh, when we go through the ham shipments, everything's all, there's paperwork done for them. They're legalized. They're our exporter, which is nice. But even then, you know, sometimes we get them and it's just paper towels and a little bit of spag moss. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. yep. you know, usually they last the trip, but sometimes yep. not. Exactly. Where do you foresee, you know, we've been here, we're, normally the feeds are an hour. We're in an hour 23. So we'll... we'll <laughs> Well, that, no, that's totally fine. Everyone's still here and everyone's still enjoying it. So, you know, that's a, a testament to you guys. That's but, awesome. Thank you. We'll, we'll say we'll, we'll, we'll tap out at about one hour and a half. But one last question for you guys is where do you foresee isopods and, and the hobby of isopods going forward? To be honest, personally, I foresee the hobby continuing to grow. You know, if you look at, you know, for example, the Facebook group isopods, the member count has grown astronomically over the past couple of months, heck years. You know, the hobby, it's amazing. You know, we're involving people all over the world to discuss mm -hmm. over one thing, which is the whole generic. Yeah. I foresee it continuing to climb, you know, 
for the amount of species that are still being, you know, looked into and, you know, from a taxonomy standpoint, being found, being, being found, recognized, being recognized yeah. it's outstanding. Yeah. Well, I think I, that, that, what's that one? You guys have that culture. We just talked about it, but that new one that they just found in Vietnam. And that took the internet by storm. All oh, of a sudden. oh, yeah. The tricolor. Yeah. 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 And yeah. this thing has got three totally, it's a black base and it's got bright red yeah. and bright yellow and other colors on it. This thing is absolutely just groundbreaking. It's going to just shock the entire community. Yeah. And it already yeah. has, but yeah. nobody has access yeah. to it. But the you guys. The is the uh, Marilunas, though. Like the, the bad thing with the Marilina species and the, uh, the whole thing right there is that they're very very slow in terms of like uh, reproduction yeah. Yeah. that's what we're told and, uh, they're, the they're very very finicky in terms of like um, conditions too so yeah we do we will get them but is it a matter, it's a matter of, of uh try to reproduce them later down yeah. the road right yeah. like it's and that might be you don't have anything available for a year year and a half anyways it's an yeah. event one of our big goals at least us at species canada with whatever we work with is to make things more accessible to the hobby as you know capped bred offspring you know going by how our isopods and how we price them and everything like that we want to we want people to be able to access them in canada without having to go to europe or the states and you know run through those not risks but you know getting a culture from Europe and yeah. having 90% of them dead, yeah. you know, we don't want people to go through that. Because they're already acclimated here and whatnot, yeah. you know, like, you yeah. know, we want people to be able to access that here and not have to worry about having a culture come to them with 90% death. Yeah. Yeah. I, I still do think that they do a uh, accustomed to whatever barometric pressure that they are. Into. Yeah. Like, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So the only thing I'd like to see change, and this is more from the way I work, is and, and Cheyenne, you and me had talked about this earlier. Is I'd like to see some more taxon taxonomic work mm -hmm. on these things. Yes, please. You know, coming up with all these stupid names, and it's like honestly, it's like it, I could be in Thailand and I could just walk into a cave and I could find this new one. I can call it whatever yeah. I want. Oh yeah. And that's and what people yeah. do. Well, two or three people calling them different things. Yeah. yeah. Like pigeon, uh, ammonia. What like, was um, on the ridiculous. group a couple weeks ago? There was one Kabaris that popped up. They called it Killmonger. I was yeah. like, what is with this name? Like Killmonger. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's other names. But, you know, going back to that same topic, you know, let's talk about rubber duckies, for example. There's there's rubber duckies. There's white duckies. There's blonde duckies. There's high yellow duckies. Now, mm -hmm. you know, are they all Every the same? Every Kabaris could be a ducky because of the way they're they're shaped. Exactly. exactly. But, you know, there's no species designation to them, which is something that I think as a community we need to work towards. Mm -hmm. The fancy names are cute and they, you know, rubber they ducky, for example. In, yeah. Exactly. They bring people in and they're endearing and their qualities are amazing. But, you know, like going back, there's no taxonomic work to it. Yeah. There's, there's, they're all undescribed at this point. Yeah. And I think we should like people work this way. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I think, <laughs> this is, if you guys, uh, anybody shares any sort of uh, interest and they want to go further, this book here is Oren McMonigle's newest book, and this is on isopod zoology. It's about a hundred bucks in ca Canada. It's a nice hardcover book. I bought it for for Christmas with Christmas money, and it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful book. He does have a, a smaller book on isopod biology that is a lot cheaper and it was his first one or any other fascinating uh, any other facets of keeping insect or isopods and stuff he has many many, many books he's an authority on it. and getting this popular hobby just like cheyenne and ivan at species canada so thank you very much my friends i absolutely appreciate you guys taking the time out of your night and i know you have two kids and uh it's sometimes a little bit challenging but uh Absolutely, from the heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so absolutely much. everyone for this tonight. Yeah, it's, we'll do it again. It's but, you know, it's first, uh, first life. <laughs> I know, right? They're pretty good. Um, <laughs> thank you. Except so for me sweating buckets right now. So it's fine. <laughs> you you know, do know where this is. I'm going to tell you. You do know where this is going, <laughs> Ivan, right? You know where this is going, Ivan, yeah. right? So, so in a week no. or so, I'm going to be at your place. We're going to be at the facility, and we're going to talk about some of those gorgeous vivari. We talk about structure, all that stuff you wouldn't do for. I can't do that. Yes, you can. So you it it. It's too late. I think the uh, I think cameras find me uh, very. Uh, if I can repulsive. do it, you can do it. Uh, <laughs> I think I'll everybody try. enjoyed it. So with that, everyone, 
Thank you and good night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care.